all of our sick and those who are challenged by many different conditions, many different circumstances, we are yet praying for you. We're praying for uh, Elder Ross Pettis today. We know that he had surgery earlier today, and uh, I haven't spoken to him since the surgery, but I do want to uh, try to reach him later tonight if, if that's possible. I don't know if he had to go into uh, intermediate care or something of that nature, but we're just praying for our elder Ross Pettis. Again, join us tonight. Invite others to be a part of this time of study and let us just have a great time in the Lord. Uh, we want you to, especially tonight, you know, when I'm teaching, you know, if people come on and uh, uh, and invite others, then that's that's fine. But when we're having guests, I especially want our guests to have a, a good audience of people uh, who will be joining us. So again, as you come on tonight, please uh, invite us to be a part. Uh, tag them, share this uh, presentation with others as we shall discuss why Black history matters uh, with my friend and my brother, Chuck Miller. We want you to be a part of this tonight. We had a great time of prayer earlier today. The Lord blessed us and he blessed us real good. I always enjoy our time of prayer. It's a time that we can come together and commune with our God. And he always hears, the Bible does indeed say uh, that we ought to be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplications, we ought to make our requests known unto him. And that's what we do uh, on a regular basis. We have prayer on Monday night, Tuesday at noon, Wednesday at noon, Thursday at seven, Friday at noon, Saturday at noon. Uh, of course, we have service on Sunday. Then we're back in prayer again Monday night. So join us for all of those times of prayer. Wednesday is our time of fasting. We fast for 12 hours on Wednesday. We trust and pray that you are uh, participating in that time of fasting. We're also doing some Bible reading. We're reading the Bible. Uh, throughout for a year and you have your schedule as to what you're to read when you are to read it and we are trusting that you are doing that and being a part of the time of bible study the time of prayer the time of fasting uh, we keep this up we're going to be a spiritual church and, uh, that's what god is looking for in these last and evil days he's looking for people who will uh Worship him in spirit and in truth. Good to see Mary Cox Williams, who is joining us tonight, and Juanita Resby. Thank all of you for being a part. And again, we want you to invite others to do so as well. It's going to be a great lesson tonight. Um, and we don't want you to miss it. Whenever you have a time to learn, don't miss it. Don't pass up the opportunity to learn, because that's what God wants us to do. He says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. So make sure that anytime you are able to be exposed to knowledge, then you make yourself available to it so that you can be a better Christian, a better uh, well-rounded Christian, uh, not one that just knows what it takes to be saved, but also what it takes to live a holy life, what it takes to be spiritual, what it takes to walk in holiness because holiness is still right. So again, join us tonight. We want you to invite others to be a part. This is still the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing and we are glad in it. Grateful are we for all that the Lord has done and all that the Lord is doing, for he keeps on doing great things for us. And we are grateful to him for all that he does. Amen. 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 All right. We're going to get ready to go uh, back into our sanctuary in just a moment. <laughs> I call it the sanctuary. Uh, Facebook has become our sanctuary. Good to see Keelan Chambers Sr. God bless you for joining us tonight. It's been a long time since we had a chance to talk, but we certainly look forward to 
being able to do that in the very near future. Nick Quitlow, God bless you for joining us. All of you, thank God for you. Thank God for this opportunity. Um, it's going to be tremendous, going to be tremendous. I'm so excited, I don't know what to do. Um, of course, normally we have our PowerPoints, our slides on our website, but tonight they're not going to be there. Now they may be there later. Um, our presenters wants to do some other things with it. Um, and we'll see what happens after he's gone through and made some changes. Of course, I want all of it, but uh, we will of course adapt to whatever he decides to present to us. But in the meantime, good to see Trevor tonight. God bless you. Uh, again, in the meantime, even though the handouts are not there tonight, they will be up at some point in time where you can go and get uh, a handout of the presentation that we'll have tonight. But uh, just take notes, get your pen, pad, uh, your device, take notes on your device, however you do it. Take some good notes. If you want to take screenshots of your uh, of the presentation, then you're welcome to do that. Uh, but we want you to just be able, able to be informed and have something to carry with you once we have finished our lesson for tonight. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer and we're going to get ready to get started uh, with our friend and brother, Chuck Miller. God, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this lesson. Thank you, oh God, for Chuck Miller tonight as he shall stand and make proclamations of your truth. He shall teach us tonight on why black history matters. And we're so grateful to have him to be a part of our lessons tonight. We pray your blessings be upon him and bless all of those who shall join us by way of whatever media outlets, social media outlets they are on. We thank you for them joining us tonight. Bless us now as I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Kingdom Now, and to those of you who are joining us by way of uh, various social media outlets tonight, I'm happy to have with us one of my, well, he is my best friend uh, other than my wife. Uh, but he's one of my closest friends uh, and he's always been that. He's, we've traveled together. Uh, I've known him since we were just mere teenagers. He's, uh, um, he serves Jesse Jackson as he travels across the country. He served him. He's retired from the US uh, Air Force as a chief uh, uh, sergeant and uh, He's from the Peach County area, and we are happy to have with us tonight uh, Chuck Miller. Chuck, are you there? You're on mute, Chuck. Take yourself off of mute, and let's get ready to go. Can All you right. hear me? Yes, sir. We can't see you, though. Uh, All right. All right. Put yourself back on video. There you go. There you go. All right, y'all. Let's welcome Chuck Miller. Good to have you tonight, Chuck. Thank you for being with us. We're in your hands. Good to be here, Bishop. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address Kingdom Now and Facebook family and all the family and friends of uh, Bishop Hutchins. It's an honor to be here to be here with you tonight. Um, before we get started, let's I have a word of prayer. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for who you are and whose you are. You th we thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We just ask you tonight to just touch the hearts of men, that you, they'll be receptive to what is said tonight, Lord. I just ask that I decrease, that you increase, so that something may be said that's inspiring, uplifting, encouraging, to help enhance the quality of life that we live from day to day. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we appreciate all that you do for us today and what you will plan to do for us in the future. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, tonight we'll embark on a journey. It's a journey that is a very interesting journey. It's a journey like none other here on mankind. And we want to talk tonight about why Black history matters why Black history matters. Um, 
We're gonna, black history does not start in America. Black history starts in the cradle of civilization. And Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who's considered the father of black history asked this question. He said, if, he said, if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. And I just wanna preface that by uh, my presentation by saying that there's a difference between framing the truth and reframing the truth. And if we don't tell our story, our truth, it is easily reframed and it has been reframed. Black history matters. Why does it matter? Well, it started in the cradle of civilization. So back in 1987, there was a lady by the name of Dr. Rebecca Can, and she embarked on a journey to want to trace the double X chromosome of the female. And so she went around the world to the South Pacific. Uh, she went to Southeast Asia, Europe, and Africa. And so she took samples of about 127 indigenous people around the world. So you wonder why did she take samples from 127 indigenous people? Well, the indigenous people are the original tribes and they will actually have the purest form of DNA. And so in her travels around the globe, she actually traced the oldest human female to the region of Southern Africa. And so right here in Africa, in Southern Africa around Botswana in the Kalahari Desert is kind of where anthropologists have agreed that human life actually began. And I say that, and so in her travels, in her quest, Dr. Buss, uh, I should say Dr. Can, actually created a, what's called a computer bus of what the first female would possibly have looked like during that time. And she traced this back approximately 200,000 years ago. And what has been produced is a computerized bus of what the first female would look like. And here goes a picture of what Anthropologists have all agreed that the very first female would actually have looked like, and she called this project, as I mentioned to you, Mitochondrial Eve, which uh, as mentioned, she started it in 1987 and it ran for about a decade or so, because it took some time, because it's a very tedious process to trace down all these different people and getting the samples and processing the samples and so on and so forth. So I will have you about 20 years later, uh, a young man from Marietta, Georgia, by the name of Dr. Spencer Wells, he actually partnered with the National Geographic Society along with IBM, and he embarked on the same journey. And he actually embarked on a journey to try to trace the oldest human male. And be mindful, he embarked on this journey around 2005 to trace the oldest human male and be mindful, we're not talking about the oldest black male. We're not talking about the oldest white male. We're just talking about the oldest male with the Y chromosome. As you know, the two X chromosome determines the sex of a human. So that's the two X is a female and the X and a Y um, produces the male. And it's the Y chromosome that gives us the male gender. And Dr. Spencer Wells of the Genographic Project he embarked on the same journey, um, obtained hundreds of samples from various humans across the globe. And the oldest human male was traced around that same region of Southern Africa. And so they've actually created a bus of what the first Adam would look like. And the, this is a picture of what they're saying that the first Adam may have possibly looked like over in the Eastern African region um, near Botswana. This is a picture of the very first Adam 
Um, and this is a picture of what Adam and Eve looked like um, as accord according to scientists and anthropologists. As you can see, um, the very first humans have much melanin in their skin. Um, they have very pronounced noses and lips. And um, if you remember back in your, your chemistry days and biology days, you probably remember a scientist by the name of Dr. Gregor Mendel. Dr. Mendel, he actually did a study. He was experienced in genetics. And one of the things that he, he discovered in his uh, genetic study is that you can get the recessive genes from the dominant, but it's virtually impossible to get the dominant from the recessive. And so dark genes are dominant. Dark skin is dominant. Dark eyes are dominant. Light eyes are recessive. Light skin is recessive. And so since you can, you can get the dominant, the, the, the recessive from the dominant, but it's virtually impossible to get the dominant from the recessive, that means that every form of human life, every race, every ethnicity had to originate from the African region and what I would call um, the African. I, would, I say that African history, all of Af African history is black history, but not all black history is necessarily African history because of much of our history as we know it is on the shores of America. And we will get there in just a little bit. But I just kind of want to show you the Botswana region, what I was talking about as far as the original, the region where we were actually discovered. If you can see on the map there, the Kalahari Desert is kind of where the uh, oldest tribe that's still there today, um, they're actually migrating there. They, they've been there, like I said, they're the oldest of human life. Um, they're commonly known as the Bushman tribe. Um, and they're the Kokoi. Um, they, they go by Sand Tribe, Koi Koi, but they're known as the Bushmen. And this is kind of what they look like. And if you look at their facial features, you will kind of see that every ethnicity, every race originated from the Sand Tribe people. They are the Koi Koi. You may have remembered that they're the ones that talk with the clicks. They, they kind of talk with clicks, um, but they have the oldest DNA um, of human life. Um, and not just black life. So uh, those that's a picture of the Bushman there. But let's kind of transition over to the Bible. You know, a lot of this is a church. And I know when I was a kid coming up, I remember seeing the, the white Jesus on the window. And I remember reading about Canaan. And I remember reading about Egypt. And I remember reading about the different places over in the Middle East. Uh, but in my study, I, I, I knew about the Arabs, and I've heard I've heard of the Arabs, but I later discovered that the word the, the word Arab means mixed. It means mixed. That's the reason why they're called Arabs because they're they're mixed. They're mixed mixed uh, with different races. And so let's kind of talk about Black history and how it matters in the Bible. Right here in Genesis two and ten and fourteen. You're probably familiar with this text. And it talks about how, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is which compasses the whole land of Havila. Havila, remember that name, Havila, where there's gold. And the gold of that land is, is good. And there's Bedellium and the onyx stone. The name of the second river is Jihon. And the same is it that it encompassed the whole land of Ethiopia. And the third river is Hedekel, Hedekel, that is which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river being the Euphrates. Now let's kind of talk about these regions for a moment because these regions during biblical times are not the regions as we know it today. You must remember now when when Noah was on that ark and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, um, Noah and his family couldn't just embark, I should say they just couldn't exit the boat and just go into the world. It took about, I think the, 
from what I understand, it took about another 150 days of the waters that kept rising. 150 days of the waters kept rising even after the flood. And even after the, after the waters stopped rising, it took another 150 something days for the waters to start leveling out and, 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 and drying up. So historians have predicted that Noah and his three sons and their wives, they actually stayed on that ark by almost around a year. It was almost a year before they could actually exit, which lets us know that that land as we knew it then has been was totally distorted after that flood. And so when we think about the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers now, of course, they don't exist, you know, the way they did during the biblical times. However, the Jihon River, um, you hear about Jihon. Jihon is what we know now as the Nile. That's actually the Nile River. We've heard of the Nile. That's the longest river in the world, the Nile River. Now let's talk a little bit about Havilah in the scripture. You heard when it mentioned about Havilah. Havilah is the land that exists right just, just east of Egypt and between Egypt and the actual Persian Gulf, you'll see the land of, of, of Havilah. And that is where anthropologists and historians have indicated that the land Havilah actually exists. As you can see, the science kind of coincides with the Bible um, as far as the locations of where things are and where things were. Um, let's talk a moment about the history of some of the biblical characters that come from African descent. As you can see there on the slide, we're mentioning Nimrod. Nimrod is known as a hunter, but let's kind of talk about Nimrod's father for a minute. You know, Nimrod was the son of Cush. And as I mentioned to you, you had Noah and his three sons that was on that ark, which is Ham, Japheth, and Shem. And Ham, who supportedly, we're actually the descendants of that son tribe, of that, of that bloodline. Ham actually had four sons. So Ham had a son named Mitram. And if you know, know anything about Mitram, Mitram is what we know now as the descendants of the Egyptians. That's the Egyptian bloodline. He also had a, a son named Foot. You may see it in the, some places in the Bible, it's listed as Put, P-U-T. Put actually is the region of Libya, it's modern day Libya as we know it. One of his other sons, um, you may have heard in the Bible, and it's used, often used interchangeably with Ethiopia, and that's the land of Cush. Cush is Ethiopia. And then the fourth son was named Canaan. And Canaan is, is what we know now as modern day Israel. Now, through that same button, I remember Ham was the son of Noah. And Cush was the son of Ham. And so let's talk about Nimrod for a minute. Nimrod was known as being a what they call a mighty hunter. Um, he was a builder. He went across all across the Mesopotamia uh, over in Iraq. Um, he built cities for a living. That's who he was. He was known as being like the world conqueror during that time. Um, he also built the city of Nineveh. Um, and, and if you know anything about Nineveh, if you do a study, you'll understand that Nineveh is full of black people. And so that's probably had a lot to do why to do with uh, Jonah not wanting to go to Nineveh. But uh, Nimrod was, was responsible for building that city and was known to be a mighty hunter. He was a mighty man of God. Um, and to kind of talk a little bit more about the bloodline of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of course, you know, when he came through the bloodline of David, and let's kind of look at the bloodline of David. If you look at David's father, Jesse, Jesse was the son of Obed. And if you know anything about history, Obed was the, was the offspring of Boaz and Ruth. And of course, Ruth was the daughter of Rahab, the harlot who's actually considered the, is in the Hall of Fame of Faith. But if you look at the bloodlines from Rahab to Ruth, Obed, 
Jesse and David, and through that same lineage, uh, Jesus was born. And if you look at the description of Jesus, um, they mentioned that his feet was burnt like brass and, and hair like lamb wool. And I think that's the kind you use soften sheen on. So um, he was a mixed person, but by all practical purpose, um, the black presence in the Bible is very strong. Uh, Moses uh, married Zipporah, who was also an African woman. Um, I mentioned about David, the father of Solomon, whose mother Bathsheba was also an African woman. And through that same lineage, when Jesus was born, and so when he was about two years old, you remember King Herod had put out a decree to kill all the boy babies two and under. And so Mary and Joseph escaped with him to Egypt. Egypt. Now, I remember reading about Egypt in Sunday school and reading about, hearing about Egypt in church. And many historians don't want to associate Egypt with Africa, but Egypt is Northern Africa. And so be mindful, Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus to Egypt. Northern Africa to camouflage him amongst the masses of the people. Northern Africa. And so he actually came back after having come up in Northern Africa. And so when we think about him going up Gargotha's Hill with that cross, remember Judas betrayed him and Peter denied him. And I say the rest of them pretty much hid, but it was only Simon an African that broke the conspiracy of silence and helped bear that cross, uh, Simon of Serene. That's, uh, that's it, Serene is in the African region. So when you think of the, 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 the black presence in the Bible, is, I think it's been overlooked. And, and the reason why I want to stress that is because I think it actually gives you a more divine sense of pride of knowing where we have come from. Um, I think it gives you a sense of pride when you can connect to understand that, you know, your ancestors were, were mighty hunters and builders and control the whole earth. You have, you know, someone of your ancestry line that actually was helping Jesus when everybody else stepped back, you had an African to step forth to help him carry that cross. Um, and I think that's critical to know. And so, Let's transition now from the biblical times where, you know, we were, we were kings and we were queens over in Africa, Most, many of the kings over in Egypt. Um, they recruited many of their kings and queens from the land of, uh, of Ethiopia. Many of them recruited, were recruited from Ethiopia. But of course, we understand that in 1619 is when slavery started in America, but slavery had been going on for quite some time. And so... There's a place over in Senegal in Gory Island called the Door of No Return. And this is what I'm showing you here, the Door of No Return. And this is actually a national museum over in Senegal where you will have families, husbands, wives, men and women and their children. They would actually come to this place right here and they would be separated. And they would be separated and they would more than likely never see each other again when they were actually packed on that slave ship when they left this door of no return to head towards America to start on what I call the journey. And if right here is a slave ship. This is a picture of a slave ship. And they packed slaves on there four or 500 on a time. I, I mean, the, 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 um, the scent from a slave ship, they say, was so strong that the stench could be smelled from as far as 10 miles away. Um, it was a very, very unsanitary condition. Now, most, a lot of the slaves, that they, they didn't quite make it across the Middle Passage, as they call it, from the western coast of Africa to across the Atlantic over to America. Many of them didn't make it. Uh, between 14 and 20 million slave sailed to, um, our ancestors sailed, sailed to America, but many didn't make it. Many didn't make it. And so 
when we go ahead to 1619 is when they actually came to the shores of America. They were, you had 20 Africans that came to the shores of America and they were sold in Jamestown, Virginia by a Dutch trader for Africa, I mean, for tobacco, indigo, and rice. And the slave trader would take the tobacco, indigo, and rice, and he sailed over to Europe where he would actually sell the produce. He would take the money and sail back to Africa to purchase additional slaves, or I should say to purchase some additional ancestors, they're our ancestors. And they will sail back to Africa, I mean, sail back to America and sell them into slavery. And so that triangle from America to Europe, from Europe back over to Africa, to Africa, from Africa back to America is what is known as the slave triangle. That's the reason why it's called the slave triangle from Africa over to America, America to Europe, Europe back to Africa. And that sequence lasted for 246 years, a very long time. And so there's a man by the name of Dr. Carter G. Whipson, Dr. Charter Carter G. Whipson in 1926, he decided that the chronicle in the journey of the Negro person was too important to not capture in some way, form or fashion. And so he actually published what's called the Chronicle of the Negro Journey. He published that book around 1916 or so. And I might add that Dr. Woodson was a very educated guy. He actually was a barber for a while and then he he actually became the second black to receive a PhD from Harvard. Um, he was beat out by, you probably heard of W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois was the first black to receive a PhD from Harvard and uh, Carter G. Woodson was right after him. And so Dr. Woodson, he actually thought that our journey was so important because of the contributions that we had made throughout our tenure here in America it was just too important to capture, uh, to not to capture. And so he actually captured it in the journal. And so you probably wonder, well, why is it that we chose uh, February as the month of, for Black history? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons why we celebrate Phillips, uh, Black History Month in February is because February 1st, 1865, is when Abraham Lincoln actually signed the 13th Amendment. Now be mindful, the Emancipation Proclamation was actually declared on September the 22nd of 1862, declaring that on January 1st, 1863, that the slaves would be free. So December 31st, 1862, that is what's called, commonly referred to as Freedom's Eve. Now we normally celebrate New Year's Eve night with watch night services, but it was known at that time as Freedom's Eve because in December the 31st, 1862, this was the first time that our ancestors would actually be free. And so December 31st, 1862, they sat there and just watched the clock. They watched the clock and they couldn't wait until the clock struck midnight. And so at 12.01, January 1st, 1863, for many, that was the first freedom here in America. Now, we might add now that that date did, just didn't come by osmosis. Now, there was a lot of fighting that took place as a result of that. Um, even before that, you may have heard of the Lincoln-Douglas debates back in 1860 when Abe Lincoln was running, running for president against Stephen F. Douglas. The Lincoln-Douglas debates pretty much was based on slavery. And, and, and of course, Lincoln was, 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 was against slavery and Douglas was for it. But I, don't want you to under, I do want you to understand something that 
when you look at the context of our freedom, Lincoln freed us, but we also saved Lincoln because January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1863. Now, those were the dates of the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, be mindful, the, the war started, kicked off in 1861 in South Carolina when the shots were fired there at Fort Sumter in Charleston. So this war was rocking around for a couple of years, and, and, and the, the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America was winning. Now, be mindful, they had their own army, they had their own, they had their states, they had their own currency, and they were winning. And so we saved Lincoln by, you had about 200,000 former slaves that joined the Union Army to fight against their former slave masters. So that's critical because we need to understand the proper context in which we were, we were free to slaves. Um, it wasn't just so much that Lincoln had such a good heart, but we saved Lincoln and Lincoln freed us. And we, I, we just can't get that twisted. And so Dr. Carter D. Woodson, as I mentioned, he thought it very important to make sure that we captured all those who actually played a role in this freedom. And so there are people like Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, okay? They were back in the late 1800s and they actually were abolitionists and they fought um, against Jim Crow and fought against slavery and so on and so forth. But they um, were the founders of the Free African Society. Um, they were from Philadelphia. Um, you may have know Richard Allen was the founder, of course, the AME Church, Mother Bethel there in Philadelphia, and Absalom Jones. Of course, he was he was the first um, Episcopalian to be um, consecrated as a, I should say, a, a ordained as a minister in the Episcopal Church. Um, Jones and Allen kind of went there. They were together for a long time, but they kind of went their separate ways. And um, and but they both did a great work on behalf of us. But before we actually get too far into understanding the roles of Jones and Allen, I, I would be remiss not to mention some of the struggles that took place before they even came on the scene. Now be mindful, I mentioned about the Battle of Gettysburg, January 1st, I'm sorry, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. When the war ended in 1865, in 1870, that is what began the period of what we called Reconstruction. And during that time, um, you, the 13th Amendment, which freed um, with end of slavery was passed, 1865, 1870. The 14th Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship, um, it was passed. And then the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed, gave us the right to vote, it also passed. But the, the, the period of Reconstruction is very important for us to understand because it was during that time that the Union actually sent federal troops and federal aid to the South to help us get back, get off, get us on our feet. And so it was working. We were empowered politically. We were empowered educationally and we were empowered economically. The problem is during the period of reconstruction, it rocked alone for about eight, about seven years or so. And there was, elect, there was an election between the Democrats and Republicans. And be mindful during that time, the political parties were not as we know them as to know them today. Uh, the Republican party of yesterday it's kind of looked upon as the Democratic Party today and the, and, the, and the Democrat Party of yesterday is kind of looked upon as the Republican Party today. Um, so the Republicans were abolitionists. They were against slavery. The Democrats were pro-slavery, pro-Jim Crow. And so the net period of 1870 to 1877, there was what you call, there was an election that was held. We had a Democrat out of New York by the name of Samuel Tilden. And Tilden actually was running as a Democrat, and Rutherford B. Hayes out of Ohio was running as a Republican. And so Hayes didn't quite have enough votes, electoral votes, to get the presidency. And so what happened is that they came up with what we know now as the Tilden-Hayes compromise, where they actually gave Hayes the presidency in exchange for removing the troops and the removing the federal aid from the South. And consequently, it sold us out. And therein, 
was the birthplace of Jim Crow. Um, it was a result, a direct result of the Tilden Hayes Compromise. Um, as further evidence of that in 1896 was Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. You probably remember that in your, in your history books and that rocked along for quite some time until around 1954 when you had Brown versus Board of Education, attorney Charles Houston and Thurgood Marshall and others, they fought um, to end separate but equal and end segregation in 1954, of course, that wasn't tried until 1957 when you had the Little Rock Central High School 9 that tried to integrate Little Rock Central High School there in Arkansas. And consequently, they were had to be escorted to school by the National Guard. And um, it was just, it wasn't good. And it just wasn't ready for us as a people quite yet. But to talk about a few more of the people that made a great contribution um, during the slave times, I just kind of want to highlight a young man by the name of William Steele. William Steele was one of the conductors, and I'm sure you've heard of the Underground Railroad. And so Steele actually was one of the conductors of that railroad. And I kind of want to highlight him because very few people know about him. We, we've heard about Harriet Tubman, but very few of us know about William Steele. And what was so unique about Steele Still would actually interview every single slave that he actually, ancestor that he actually came in touch with. And one, during one of the times of his interviews, he actually was talking to a young man and the young man had some very unique life experiences that he was sharing with Steele and Steele just dropped his pen. And he was just in such disbelief because he realized that he was talking with his own brother. And consequently, as a result of that interaction, the Steele family to this day actually have family reunions up in Philadelphia. Every year, um, the descendants of Mr. Steele still have family reunions to this day. And this is a copy of the book that he wrote called The Underground Railroad Records, um, you can, if you're interested in it. Um, it's very interesting, very interesting. It's uh, actual interviews and narratives of his interviews with those who were actually escaping from the South. I actually got a rare opportunity to actually visit one of the stops of the Underground Railroad. And this is actually in a church there in Rochester. And the way the Underground Railroad, it wasn't, of course, you know, it wasn't a physical railroad, but it was a network of systems of houses, hiding places, signals, so on and so forth, to kind of give the, our ancestors directions of how to navigate to freedom. And so this is inside of a church. And as you can see, it looks like just a regular, um, the bottom of a, of a wall. But as you will plainly be able to see, this actually opens up. And right inside of there is our staircase. And if you look real closely, you'll actually see the steps. And this actually went down into the basement of the church where many of our ancestors were hide before they navigated and was able to escape to a place called Kelsey's Landing, which is a landmark there in Rochester, New York. And this is a picture of Kelsey's Landing. This was the last place that our ancestors were stopped. And this was at the end of the Underground Railroad where they were board a Canadian vessel into freedom up in Canada. And that's the reason why there's such a strong African-American presence there in Canada, because many of our ancestors actually escaped from the railroad and caught one of these vessels into Canada. John Barry Meacham, Meacham he's a very interesting guy. Um, John Barry Meacham, um, he was actually a, um, he was a minister. He was also an entrepreneur, but he actually had a passion for education. And so he actually had a school there in Missouri and because it was against Missouri law for for blacks to be able to learn to read and et cetera, he actually assembled a sailboat and he got tables and chairs and books, so on and so forth. And he actually put them on a ship. He charged a dollar tuition, one dollar tuition. And you would go out and you would actually learn on his freedom, his floating freedom school. 
And one of his students uh, was a guy by the name of James Milton Turner. Uh, he actually started the Lincoln Institute and that institute is now known as Lincoln University there in Lincoln, Missouri. But it all uh, actually began with Mr. Meacham. One of our other um, guys that actually contributed immensely to the uh, HBCU scene was a guy by the name of Senator Justice Smith Morrell of Vermont. Um, he was a senator there in Vermont and he proposed what's called the Morrell Land Grant Act. And what this act would do with, with every 30,000 people in a state, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, for every congressperson that that state had, he would donate uh, about 30,000 acres of land for educational purposes to build schools and et cetera. And so you may have heard of the Morrill Land Grant Act and Morrill Land Grant Institutions, but he proposed this act back in 1857 with um, President James Buchanan, and it was vetoed. And so he passed it again under President Lincoln in 1862, and Lincoln signed it in the legislation. And as a result of the Morrill Land Grant Act, we now have, the that's uh, Senator Morrill, um, we now have these land grant universities as listed. All these schools that's listed, Alabama a m Alcorn, Central State, Delaware, you know, my hometown, Fort Valley, these are all land grant universities, but they're a direct recipient and, and a beneficiary of the land grant act of Senator Justin Morrill. And that's important to know. I kind of want to talk about a little bit more about attorney Fred Gray. Now he's a, he's a icon because as I mentioned to you earlier, as far as the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, attorney Fred Gray is probably one of the most under-recognized and, and not less well-known historical heroes that we have in America. Um, attorney Gray was actually hails from Montgomery, Alabama. And one thing about attorney Fred Gray that a lot of people don't know is that you've heard of Rosa Parks and her migrating, uh, integrating the bus system. Well, attorney Fred Gray took her case along with several other cases and argued her case before the Supreme Court. And uh, it was attorney Fred Gray's work that actually resulted in the integration of public transportation here in America. Um, He's an unsung hero. Uh, Fred Gray actually represented the, uh, the integration of Auburn University. Um, he actually represented the defendants there to integrate Auburn. Um, he also represented those, you've heard of the syphilis experiment and you know the syphilis experiment here lately has been quite popular because you have several who are choosing not to want to get the vaccine for COVID. But attorney Fred Gray, actually was the attorney of record who represented those guys that was injected with the most virulent form of syphilis with the Tuskegee experiment. And so he is one of our heroes. Um, he's still alive, he's in his nineties um, over in Montgomery. And the last I heard it was a couple of years ago, I know actually he was still practicing law um, at the ripe age of 90. So that's attorney Fred Gray. That's Attorney Gray and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. back in 55 when they were discussing the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, here's another picture of attorney Fred Gray, Rosa Parks uh, and Dr. Abernathy and Dr. King after one of uh, Rosa Parks court, court appearances. So it's important to know about attorney Fred Gray. Um, we know about Dr. King. We know we many of us have heard of Dr. Abernathy Many of us have heard of Rosa, Rosa Parks, but there was another lady that was behind the scenes that was the best friend of Rosa Parks, and her name was Dr. Johnny Carr. And it was Dr. Johnny Carr, who actually was the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, that actually was able to push the envelope with Dr. King to help integrate those buses. I might add that um, it was that bus boycott, which was predicted to last no more than a week, 
Um, it lasted about 381 days. And that was a landmark decision there for them to integrate those buses. And ironically enough, in 1957 um, is when the SCLC was formed. Um, December the 5th, 1st, 55 is when Rosa Parks refused to sit, on the, sit at the back of the bus. August 28th, 55, unfortunately, Emmett Teal was killed. And then in 1957 is when Dr. King actually founded the SCLC. And so that's very critical because it laid the foundation of what was to come in the 60s. Um, when you think about 1960, Dr. King, be mindful, he was born in 1929. So he was a very young, tender man, tender age, around the age of 26 when he came to Rosa Parks Rescue. Approaching the 60s, Dr. King was approaching 30 years old. And so 1963, it's important for us to understand is that when Dr. King delivered that address there in Washington, D.C., on the March on Washington, Dr. King was only the ripe age of about 34 years old. And he was well ahead of his time, but he was a visionary. He was a prophet because even to this day, his message today concerning the dream is more needed now than ever before. And if you really leave, if you really review the essence of that speech, that speech really wasn't just about a dream, but he also talked about how that the America government had given the Negro a bad check that was marked insufficient fund, and he just refused the funds, and he refused to believe that there were actually no funds in the Bank of Justice. And so he fought, he saw in America not for what it was, but what it should be and what it ought to be. He continued to push. And so he wasn't killed for just dreaming. Dr. King was killed for living out what he discussed in the essence of that speech. Fast forward to 1964, the Civil Rights Bill, 65. That was critical because March 6th, 1965 was when we actually had to fight Bloody Sunday to get the right to vote. And it was on that bridge in Selma that the, our nameless, faceless, those like Miss Amelia Boynton Robinson, John Lewis, James Orne, Cotton Reader, some of the nameless, faceless, C.T. Vivian and others, wrote in blood on that bridge what President Johnson later wrote in ink. So when I think about politics and I think about the importance of why Black history matters, politics has always, always been most effective from the bottom up, not top down. And so the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, open houses in 66. And so ironically enough, if you think about the children of Israel, that was in the wilderness for 40 years. In 1968, from the balcony of the Lorraine Motel to 2008, to the balcony of the White House was a 40 year journey. And right at the mid-year mark in 1988, one of our mo most world-renowned historic civil rights leaders, Reverend Jesse Jackson, ran for the presidency and put his hat in the ring for the Democratic nomination. And that's ironic that at the 20 year mark of that 40 year journey, Reverend Jackson would lay the seed, plant the seed to make the balcony of the White House of President Barack Obama possible in 2008. So our journey has been a very, very interesting journey. Um, it's been a long journey but we have taught the world how to turn lemons into lemonade. We've taken adversity. We've taken challenge. We've taken difficulties. And we've taken everything that was thrown to us and we've shown them how to mix it up, 
with some sugar of hope, some sugar of encouragement, and sugar of inspiration, and turn it into lemonade. So, you know, I, I'm sure I'm of time. Is, yeah, I'm sure I'm out of time, but I just wanted to share with you all that Black history matters because without Blackness, without our ethnicity, um, human life wouldn't even exist. I mean, we were at the very foundation, at the cradle of civilization. Um, we were there in the Bible, and uh, we have the most unique journey here to man. And so even when I think about, you know, La Virtue, Tucson, over in Haiti, Haiti was the very first country that received their independence in 1804, but had it not been for Tucson defeating Napoleon, um, President Jackson wouldn't have actually been able to purchase the Louisiana Purchase to double the size of America. It was because Napoleon had expended all his resources trying to defeat uh, Tucson, which actually let, set the stage in order for us to be able to acquire Louisiana to double the size of the United States. So we're all over cross history. We're over work. We're, we're in world history. We're, we're in American history, African history, world history. And so uh, thank you, Bishop Hutchins, for allowing me an opportunity to share why Black history matters. And I hope someone tonight was able to get something to take with them so that in case someone ever asks you why Black history matters, uh, you can tell them unequivocally why we matter with definitive science and facts. God bless you. Well, thank you, Chuck Miller. That was absolutely tremendous. Uh, and if you would stop sharing the slide just for a moment so that I can uh, get the screen. Again, I wanted to say to you and be able to see you more clearly that uh, every time I talk to you and I, you know, you are just a history buff and you just, <laughs> you talk this stuff like you're talking about the weather and it's, it's appreciative to know that God has equipped you, he has empowered you, he's uh, placed all this in you. And people may think that you are reading from, from notes, but all of this is just in, this is just in his mind. He just, he just regurgitates it, he just talks about it. And sometimes he and I can talk on the phone for 20 or 30 minutes and he's talking about this stuff and I'm kind of dozing off, but uh, this, is, this is Chuck. And it's things that we need to know, it's things that we need to recognize, we need to remember. Um, I'm going to be downloading uh, this into an MP4, if any of you would like, because I know that there are parents even, your children need to be able to listen to this kind of thing over and over and over and over again, so that they can be, because as we talked about on Sunday, sometimes with the repetition of things, uh, we can learn it more and it becomes more manifested and more powerful. So again, thank you tonight, Chuck. Thank you so very much. And I learned some things tonight. Uh, I did not know, I'm sure I've heard it. I did not know about the whole uh, land grant act. That was new to me, uh, but very, very interesting uh, that many of our HBCUs are now as a consequence of the Land Grant Act. And um, so again, if you would like a copy of this presentation tonight in video, then just uh, email administration at kingdomnow.org, administration at kingdom-now.org, and we will get that to you again, because it is indeed important and valuable information. Thank you again, Chuck Miller. All right. Now, if you all just desire to give tonight, you know the platforms that we use to do that. You can do so, but just know that we are deeply appreciative of your joining us tonight and sharing with us during this time of presentation by Chuck Miller. Uh, he gave me some preaching stuff. What they wrote in blood, Johnson wrote in ink. I can preach that. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. God, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity for us to have shared on why Black history matters. We've gone all the way back to the cradle, the cradle of civilization, the cradle of time. And we have seen how our people 
have been instrumental in teaching others and other nations and other ethnic groups, teaching them how to survive, how to struggle, how to advance and how to overcome things. And we thank you for that. Thank you for who we are. Thank you for the fact that you made us black and we are so grateful for who we are. So bless us, keep us, guide us and direct us. Give us a good night of rest is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so